Well, welcome everybody. You are in the right place if you are supposed to be in uh, ESRM uh, Bio 313, Conservation Biology. Um, so welcome. Happy, I hope everybody had a good summer. Did everybody have a good summer? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, nice. <clears throat> so we are uh, going to talk about conservation biology this semester. Before we get into it, though, I just wanted to say I'm going to try doing a couple podcasts of some of my lectures uh, this year as a study aid to you. So you may wish to review some of these lectures later on, um, which is great. Uh, maybe some folks from outside our class uh, in the general public might be interested in some of this stuff. But any podcasting we do, any um, handouts, all that kind of stuff, nothing is meant to substitute for coming to lecture. It's for a couple reasons. One, because some of these things I might put up um, might not be the same version that you get. I'm constantly updating the data and, and the information. Secondly, um, the most important part of our class is the interaction. So I can stand up here and talk and show you pretty pictures and all that good stuff, but you really need to get um, the idea straight in your head. And the lecture format is one of our best places for you to talk to me. Of course you can come see me in office hours and all that kind of stuff. We'll go over our, our syllabus in a little bit. But this is the place where as we're going through something, you've done the readings, um, you've worked on the labs, we're in here, we're talking about it in lab, if it, in lecture, excuse me, if that doesn't make sense, then you need to come uh, and, and, and stop that lecture right there, bring us to a halt and say, hey, I don't get it, why is that graph that way or what have you. <clears throat> you can't get that solely from a a um, recorded media. You need to have the interaction. So having said that, um, we're recording this uh, this first lecture in August of 2008, right? So we we're just in the middle of, or just ending the Olympics in Beijing. And so it seems an appropriate time to just uh, bring up some examples from China, not to pick on China. By no means is China um, the only problem area in our planet or, or um, such things, but since we've all been watching a lot of this stuff on our iPods and on television and stuff, it's right in our uh, faces of late, some of the issues, all kinds of problems. As we'll learn, pollution is a major problem on our planet, but uh, is dwarfed by many other issues. However, it's something we can easily see, and it's something that most folks tend to to focus on as, as something when they identify a problem in the environment. This class is focused on the biological component of all these things. So conservation biology is an effort to take ecology <clears throat> and several related disciplines, excuse me, and come together and provide some solutions to rectify some of the, the problems that we now face. The ultimate challenge of conservation biology right now is the fact that we're experiencing an expanding footprint of we human beings here on this planet. And that footprint is so big now um, that we're actually threatening all or, or a huge amount of the life that's existed on this planet um, for tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, and in some cases, billions of years. Uh, here we see, here's, here's China. Um, this is an image from a couple years ago from a NASA satellite, from the um, Aqua satellite. And what we see here is just a massive uh, amount of plume emissions uh, blasting over out into the ocean, going up through uh, over Japan. We've heard a lot of this of late. Here is one image of Beijing <clears throat> in uh, uh, one week and from the same hotel room the following week. Um, in Beijing, a good air day isn't necessarily a blue sky, that'd be fantastic, but a good air day is a day when you can typically see your shadow on the ground. Okay. 
And in many other cities, 18 of the world's 20th most polluted cities in the context of air quality and water quality, um, unfortunately, are in China. Um, and then uh, you might have seen some of the sailing events um, uh, a few days ago uh, in Qingdao Bay. And here we see uh, the bay about, um, about three weeks before the Olympics started when it was much of it was essentially a solid mat of marine algae. And so the army had to be brought in, and huge amounts of townsfolks came down to the edge of the bay to manually clean this out. So eutrophied, so polluted with nutrients was this, um, this area of China. All of this, this expanding footprint, the challenge that we face as conservation biologists and, and the problems we'll delve into as we go throughout the semester um, in our class here, uh, is ultimately the number of people we have on our planet and the increasing affluence of those people or, or how many resources are consumed uh, by um, a given person on average. We'll talk about habitat fragmentation. We'll talk about all kinds of other issues. But ultimately, what's causing the problem, the crisis that we're experiencing right now on our planet, boils down to the number of people and how those people are living. Yes, China has some massive problems. But increasingly, our world is interconnected. And so, this isn't just pumping out coal so that people in China can have a, a warm uh, house to sleep in, although part of it is that. But it's pumping out coal to make the shoes that almost everybody, if not everybody here, is wearing today, to wear the pants and the clothes. So we are an interconnected system. It's another big theme that we'll talk about over the course of the semester. Uh, so welcome to Conservation Biology, and let's have a, uh, a good time. A couple themes we'll see repeat over and over again in our class. We'll see, this, see these in different ways, in different, um, with different examples. You should look at all five of these things. And uh, as we complete a, a section in our readings, or a particular lab activity, or a series of lectures, um, you should go back and, and find evidence for each of these statements to support each of these different statements um, because they are the core uh, pillars of the emerging discipline of conservation biology. The first and perhaps the most important is simply that resources are overexploited. That maybe is, does not sound like that big a deal, but believe me, this is a massive undertaking to prove to certain folks and certain locations on our planet, this is the case. Some people don't see a problem. Before we can talk about solutions, we have to first agree that there indeed is a challenge that needs to be met. So the first point there is that resources are overexploited. Secondly, populations and communities, which are the main things that we'll be studying here in, uh, in this course, populations and communities haven't been managed or monitored long enough to know if we're managing them properly. This is an issue of temporal scale. Okay. So we have a few systems that we've been monitoring intensively for a long time, Aldo Leopold's grasslands and, and uh, a couple intertidal areas here and there for, for several decades. Um, and if we're creative and using historical ecology, we can even get some longer time sets. But by and large, we've only really quantitatively looked at several of these systems, most of these systems, for a few years to a few decades in any kind of robust manner. So we just don't have a long enough time series. And that creates a lot of challenges for us as conservation biologists. Thirdly, most management decisions are derived in petri dishes, not pastures, meaning um, this is a spatial scale thing, meaning that because of resources and, and, and logistics and everything else, we oftentimes focus on the small scale because we can manipulate it, we can uh, spend a few dollars and, and, and get the equipment that would cover a few square meters with some particular uh, chemical or something of that nature. And the assumption is 
that, hey, if it worked here in our, in our classroom, it'll work on campus, it'll work in the county, it'll work at the state level. And uh, maybe that is the case, but maybe it's not. Uh, this will cause us also um, several problems. So we have a temporal scale issue, a spatial scale issue. Fourthly, um, and this is more of the, the human dimensions side of conservation and how conservation practices are actually enacted, we see that short-term considerations often trump longer-term considerations when we're talking about a particular management activity, a particular design for the recovery of a species, something of that nature. Not just a problem for conservation biology, but it, it becomes quite apparent in many of our uh, conservation biology controversies. And then lastly, uh, I'm usually charged with bumming all you guys out. So uh, <laughs> one of the common comments I get from you guys is that, uh, um, uh, man, this, is this sucks and we're never going to be able to fix anything. And, and I don't mean to give that impression. If I do, I, I apologize. Yes, we are facing some very difficult challenges, but despair throwing up our hands and saying, oh my God, it's too hard to deal with or we can't deal with that. Um, that's, that's simply a luxury we, we cannot afford. The stakes are too high. Things are getting too bad. And so uh, with that, let's get into our, our first lecture, our first real lecture of the semester. Ready? Ready? Nice. Okay, here we go.